The beast who is dominated by the harlot system rises against her and destroys her and her system completely. Without doubt, the harlot system was in competition with the religious worship of the beast promoted by the false prophet, and her destruction is brought about so that the beast may be the sole object of false worship as he claims to be God. This week on Connecting the Gap, we continue our study on prophecies of the Bible, and we wrap up Revelation 17 this week. We're going to get into that right after this. Well, we definitely hope that you've had an awesome week so far. Welcome to Connecting the Gap podcast. I'm Daniel Moore, your host for this podcast, coming your way every week on Thursdays. Thank you once again for joining me this week as we're going to continue our study on prophecies of the Bible. This is a study based on one by Damon Duck. Thank you for joining me this week. Visit my website, connectingthegap.net. There you'll find all the resources that you need to learn about our ministry, learn how to subscribe to one of our podcasting platforms. You can also figure out how to contact us there. And if you are someone that is in search of God in your life, never been saved before and would like to know how to be saved, there is a page there for that as well, a step-by-step process of how to become a child of God. And of course, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to contact us with the contact page here at Connecting the Gap, and we'll do our best to answer those questions, pray for you, or whatever the need may be. If you need a Bible, just let us know, and we will get you one. Uh, it's, we're here just for you here at Connecting the Gap. We're going to go ahead and get started this week. Last week we started in Revelation chapter 17, and we made it all the way through verse 13. And so this week we're going to be starting off with verse 14 of chapter 17, and we're going to get right into this. It says in Revelation 17, 14, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. At the end of the tribulation period, the Antichrist and his ten puppet kings will make war against the Lamb and his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Unfortunately for them, the outcome was determined long ago. The Lamb will defeat them in the Battle of Armageddon because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Only those who are called, chosen, and faithful will be with Jesus. Revelation seventeen fifteen. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The waters that the harlot sits on in Revelation 17, 1 are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. This base of power and support will give the harlot religious system tremendous control. She will ensnare and deceive people on a worldwide scale. Revelation 17, 16, And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, those will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. During the first half of the tribulation period, the Antichrist or the beast will be submissive to Babylon, the mother and her false religious system, and the city and its one world government. Now, John tells us that the Antichrist and his ten puppet kings, or the ten horns, will rise up against Babylon at the midpoint of the tribulation period. The Antichrist will enter the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and declare himself to be God. Obviously, there is no more room for Babylon and her one world religion and one world government. The Antichrist cannot be God and subject to those to worship him at the same time. So someone must go. The Antichrist and his allies will destroy the harlot's religious system. They will confiscate her expensive clothing, gold and precious stones, and they will persecute and kill her poor deceived people. The fact that they will eat her flesh and burn her with fire is indicative of the intensity and totality of the harlot's end. Nothing will remain. John Hagee was quoted, but what the Antichrist does not realize is that God has sovereignly moved to give him the ability to overthrow the Babylonian system, and that soon it will be the Antichrist's turn to experience a judgment that is swift, total, and dreadful. This wicked woman Babylon has two identities. In addition to being a harlot, she is also an actual city. This verse is about the destruction of the harlot. The destruction of the city will come later. 
Revelation 17, 17. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. This is an interesting verse. The Antichrist doesn't know it, but he really is a puppet king just like the ten under him. God will plant the idea of destroying the false religious system into his heart and the hearts of his ten puppet kings. Destruction of the harlot religious system is the reason God will agree to give them power. They will be instruments in his hand to accomplish his purpose and fulfill his words. Revelation seventeen eighteen, And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. This verse identifies the woman. She is the great city that rules over the earth. Unfortunately, this is not clear enough for some experts because they want to spiritualize or not take anything literally, everything in Revelation. Depending upon who the expert is, this city could be Rome, Jerusalem, New York, the United States, part of the European group of nations, or a nation in control of those nations. Babylon is called that, or this great city, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, 18, verse 10, verse 16, verse 18 through 19, and verse 21. It would be inconsistent if John was referring to any city other than literal Babylon here. All the other cities John writes about in the book of Revelation are literal cities, so why should commentators not think he is talking about a literal city here? Furthermore, chapter 18 talks about Babylon burning in one hour. That fits Isaiah's prophecy that the literal city will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, as said in Isaiah 13, 19, and 20, and Jeremiah's prediction that God will make the ancient city a burnt mountain in Jeremiah 51:25. The idea that the city will be rapidly rebuilt should not be discounted. Some say Saddam Hussein started rebuilding it in the 1980s. Some predict it will be rebuilt, but located closer to the Persian Gulf. Some predict it will be rebuilt and that the United Nations will move there from New York City. Some say America's presence in Iraq could be the Lord's way of laying the groundwork for some of these things. It's still a mystery, but the literal fulfillment of God's word happens more than most people realize. Charles Dyer was quoted, Babylon will claw its way to the heights of power and influence one last time. The Bible's prophecies will be fulfilled when someone announces that Babylon will become their capital. Babylon will again become the capital of an empire in the Middle East. Stanley Price was quoted, The ecumenical movements under the Pope's leadership are leading to religious Babylon, the world trade movement to commercial Babylon, and the new world order to political Babylon. After the rapture, the horror of religious Babylon will rule the revived empire for three and one half years, be overthrown, and the beast of political Babylon will become ruler on planet Earth. That's going to wrap up chapter 17 of Revelation. So we're going to go ahead and move right on to Revelation chapter 18 here on Connecting the Gap. So chapter 17 is about mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. But chapter 18 drops the word mystery and picks up the word city. So it's time to shift our focus from the mystery to the city, from the coming one world harlot religious system to the home of the coming one world political and economic system, from the bride of Antichrist to the city of Antichrist. Satan will be cast down to this earth at the middle of the tribulation period. He tries to copy everything Jesus does. The ancient city of Babylon and the coming rebuilt version appear to be that old serpent's pathetic effort to have wicked men build him a capital city on earth that will rival the holy city, New Jerusalem, that Jesus and God will occupy on the new earth. Andy Woods and Tim LaHaye was quoted, of Revelation's 404 verses, 278 allude to the Old Testament. When the Old Testament uses the word Babylon, the reference is always to literal Babylon. The same is likely true for Revelation. Human history will eventually cycle back to where it all began. In the same region where the first world emperor led mankind in a universal political and religious revolt against God, the future Antichrist will also lead the last collective revolt before Christ returns. Kicking off Revelation chapter 18 with verse 1. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. 
Here, after witnessing the coming destruction of the one world harlot religious system, John received a new revelation. He saw another angel coming down from heaven that will tackle the powerful and wealthy one world political and economic system. When this angel arrives, it will not be the sun, moon, or stars that light the earth, but the angel's glory. This suggests that he will come directly from the presence of God. Revelation 18.2 And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. The angel will prophesy about the future of Babylon the Great. It will fall and become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. This great and beautiful city will become a dark and loathsome place. This fulfills what the Old Testament prophets said. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. That's Revelation 14.8. Certain scholars suggest the great city described in this chapter cannot be the literal Babylon. They seem to think the current city of Babylon is too small, too remote, and more of a tourist attraction. They overlook what the Antichrist could do if several dozen nations flew in work crews and materials from around the world. A hundred nations with unlimited financing, hundreds of engineers, modern equipment, and thousands of workers could turn Babylon into a great city virtually overnight. Joseph Chambers was quoted, The prophecy world is filled with ministers and Bible teachers that refuse to take Revelation chapter 18 literally. That is why I stress this point, because this will soon be a great frontier in fresh Bible prophecy fulfillment and hopefully new understanding. Revelation 18, verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. This is a picture of government and business becoming obsessed with and controlled by a concept. Every nation on earth has delved into the idea of world government and world trade. By the time the tribulation period arrives, they will be intoxicated with it. The idea will receive their full support, and the businessmen involved will become extremely wealthy. The fall of communism has paved the way for a world economy and a world government. The global web is tightening around us every day. Many people ask what prophecy says about the United States. Some students of prophecy think the United States is mentioned in a general way, or as not by name, but that is mostly speculation and cannot be proved. Others think the United States will collapse or be destroyed because it is not specifically mentioned, but that is also impossible to prove. The United States would be wise to support Israel during the tribulation period, but with the church gone, it seems reasonable to conclude that it will be closely aligned with Europe and its Antichrist. Revelation 18.4 And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. A voice from heaven will urge God's people to leave Babylon for two reasons. So they will not become involved in Babylon's sin, and so they will not fall victim to the plagues God will inflict on Babylon. Even during this terrible time of God's wrath being poured out, it's obvious that God still cares about his people. The church has been raptured, so these are tribulation saints, not the church. But it's clear that God will have people living on earth at the close of the tribulation period. How they will survive in Babylon without taking the mark of the beast is a mystery, but they will. And some will even make it into the millennium. Leon Morris was quoted, Persecuted and harried as they were, the people of God must have been sorely tempted to come to terms with the city. Then not only would their persecution cease, but the city would make them rich and comfortable. But it is important that they see the issues for what they really are and have nothing to do with unclean things. Revelation 18 verse 5, For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. In the Old Testament, God did not overlook what Babylon was doing when she tried to build a tower to heaven, and he will not overlook this. To stop construction on the Tower of Babel, which was a tower built to reach God, he confused their language and scattered them around the world. In the future, to stop their sins from piling any higher, he will burn her to the ground. 
Mal Couch and Joseph Chambers were quoted. Some strongly argue that though a long time has passed since the early wickedness of Babylon, it only seems as if God has forgotten her sins. But the Lord will recall them to mind. The last Babylon is but the final outgrowth of the same principles that animated the first. Old offenses will help flame the final vengeance. Revelation 18.6 Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works, and the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. Life in Babylon will be like a boomerang. God's law of sowing and reaping will come into effect. Those who offer no mercy will receive no mercy. Farmers must decide what kind of crop they want to harvest. Then they must sow the kind of seed that will produce that crop. Babylon citizens should consider how they want God to treat them and then treat others accordingly. Someone once said, what goes around comes around. It is predicted that in 30 years there will be no Christians in the Palestinian controlled areas of Israel. Palestinian persecution is driving them out of the land where Christ was born. Babylon's cup will be filled with abominable things. It's time here for us to take a short break. We'll come back and be with Revelation chapter 18, verse 7, right after this message. This is Don Stevens of MercyShips.org with the Mercy Minute. Here in Mercy Ships, we put our faith into action through providing surgical medical care to people in some of the poorest countries in the world, and lives are changed forever. Listen as volunteer Harry Porter describes the transformations. What I actually found the most intriguing and exciting about Mercy Ships was that its philosophy of ministry was identical to my own. It's very holistic. Mercy Ships ministers both to the physical as well as the spiritual. And it's that kind of transformation that I think we have to have in missions. And you can put your faith into action by serving on board one of our hospital ships. Visit mercyships.org slash volunteer to find out more. This is Don Stevens of Mercy Ships, bringing hope and healing to the world's forgotten poor. You can see more of Harry's story by visiting mercyships.org. Continuing on deeper into Revelation chapter 18 with verse 7. It says, In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. This godless city will be filled with the proud and haughty. Her residents will declare her beauty, greatness, glory, and her reign over all the earth. They will think she is a queen and that she is married to the kings of the earth. As such, she is not a widow, but a wealthy queen who has nothing to mourn about. They will be self-deceived and will extol her around the world. Never mind the fact that God brought her down in one day during the reign of Belshazzar. The voice from heaven will say, In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. This will be one of God's standards of judgment when he remembers Babylon. The great grief of the godly will be turned into glory, and the glory of the godless will be turned into great grief. J.H. Melton was quoted, When the nations become wealthy, they become independent, and no longer sense the need of God. The history of the great nations in the past reveals wealth and prosperity to be responsible for their fall. Today, many global corporations and world leaders are making decisions for the sole purpose of producing wealth. They cannot see God's love, mercy, and grace because they are only looking for a big return on their investments. Unfortunately, their willing blindness will be no excuse when God decides that their sins are piled high enough. Revelation 18.8 Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, And she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. As the home of one world government and global trade, Babylon will think she is very powerful. She will control powerful weapons and great armies. But compared to the Lord God, who will judge her, this highly touted strength will be like a dart gun. What no earthly army can do, God will accomplish in one day. 
First, the angel of death will pass over Babylon. Second, the city that just finished saying, I will not see sorrow, will grieve bitterly. Third, this rich city will suddenly run out of food. Last, it will be burned to the ground. Jack Van Imp was quoted, The treasures of the tribulation enterprises do not last. Neither will they last for you if this is all you want out of life. The head of a Gentile world kingdom in Egypt was a man called Pharaoh. He dreamed about seven fat cows with plenty to eat, followed by seven skinny cows with very little to eat. He thought this was very significant and called in his advisors, but they could not interpret the dream. Then he called in Joseph, who told him God is letting Pharaoh know that Egypt will go through seven years of good harvest with plenty to eat, followed by seven years of poor harvest with very little to eat. Pharaoh believed Joseph, built storehouses for food, and located them in areas where the food could be easily distributed. The preparations paid off. Seven years of tremendous harvest came followed by seven years of worldwide famine, with Egypt being severely affected, but the nation handled it well. After moving to the Promised Land, Abraham and his nephew Lot decided to separate. Lot eventually moved to the city of Sodom. It was a beautiful city, but it was full of injustice and sordid sins called sodomy, or homosexuality. Because of this, God decided to destroy Sodom and the equally sinful neighbor city of Gomorrah. He sent angels to tell Lot what was going to happen and to get Lot and his family out of Sodom. Lot barely escaped when fire fell from heaven and burned the cities to the ground. Revelation 18 verse 9. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. The destruction of Babylon will be worldwide news. Kings, dictators, politicians, and those who supported her will see the smoke billowing up into the air, causing them to grieve and cry. By sundown, they will see a heap of smoldering rubble. It will remind many of what happened to the World Trade Center tires in New York City. It'll be time for the cradle of civilization to bury the coming New World Order. Revelation 18.10 Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. The kings, dictators, and politicians will shake in fear. Panic will grip them. The cry of alas, alas reveals deep anguish and terror because their destruction will come in one hour. A few experts suggest that one hour could mean a short space of time or spread out over a few days. But most think it means suddenly or instantaneously. That will add to the panic and terror. Notice that Babylon is called the mighty city. Some translations say city of power. This will be the power center of Antichrist, the ten kings, the false prophet, presidents and prime ministers, the super center of global governance and global trade. In the near future, vigilant Christians may want to focus on the efforts to rebuild Iraq and the struggle for so-called religious freedom in that Islamic hotbed. Revelation 18.11 And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Not only will the heads of state weep, but so will the world's big businessmen. However, it will not be over the loss of life, loss of souls to hell, or even their own sins. They will weep and mourn over their loss of customers. Following the disasters that struck the United States early this century, some oil companies, lumber companies, and others were criticized for making windfall profits. It's not surprising to learn that Babylon will be filled with merchants who enrich themselves during the disasters of the tribulation period. Warren Worsby was quoted, The wealth of the city provides for many nations and employs many people. It is worth noting that not only do the merchants lament the fall of Babylon, but also the kings of the earth. Business and government are so intertwined that what affects one affects the other. Revelation 18.12 Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Here purple and scarlet were worn by royalty in John's day. Silk was so scarce that one time it was outlawed. Citron wood was also scarce and highly sought for ornamental purposes. However, during the tribulation period, Babylon will import these cargoes frequently. These are the goods of an affluent society. 
The global traders will pile them up in Babylon, but the apostle James warned about such things when he said, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. That's James 5, 1-3. It will be boom time in Babylon when the billionaires head there, but it will be bust when the balls of fire falls. God gives wealth, but he meant for it to benefit society, not to enrich a few. Revelation 17.4 says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Revelation 18.13 And cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. Some additional products large corporations of the world will deal in during the tribulation period are expensive perfumes, spices, food, grain, cattle, and even human beings. This is a picture of large corporations that will sell anything for a profit. It is also a picture of businessmen crying because they have lost sales. It seems almost unthinkable that we would have slavery in this modern world. Nevertheless, slavery is a tragic reality in Sudan, and there is virtually no outcry from global leaders or human rights activists around the world. The jihad, or holy war, being waged against Christians and non-Muslims in Sudan has caused the death of about 3 million people. Christian and non-Muslim villages are being burned, the men are being killed, and the women and children are being sold into open slave markets for sometimes as little as 10 to $15 apiece. When the tsunami struck several southeastern nations in 2004, thousands of children were separated from their parents. Some news reports expressed concern that these children would be seized and sold into slavery, but if anything was ever done to stop people who deal with slaves, it didn't get reported. Christians are sold as slaves in some Islamic countries. Women are sold into slavery as prostitutes in some Asian countries, and there are even reports of this happening in the Caribbean and some South American countries. The preacher's outline in Sermon Bible was quoted, The picture will be the same as has been true in every Holocaust down through history. The souls of men will mean no more than another piece of merchandise or commodity. All to be used for the benefit of the state and the comfort of the supporters of the state. From their treasures, the wise men gave the baby Jesus gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's Matthew 2, verse 11. Revelation eighteen fourteen. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. Here the global traders will acknowledge that the Babylonian dream has been destroyed. All her riches and glory will be gone forever. Oliver B. Green was quoted, Heaven is here announcing to this woman that her playhouse is wrecked forever and she is down never to rise again. Babylon has always been associated with wealth. It is appropriately called the kingdom of gold in Daniel 2. The most famous gardens the world has ever known are called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They have been designated one of the seven wonders of the world. In order to make the mountain princes he married feel at home, King Nebuchadnezzar built terraces for gardens that were 400 feet square and as high as 75 feet. Flowers, shrubs, and trees were planted on those terraces, and slaves worked the gardens day and night. Revelation 18.15 The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Here the businessmen who prospered by brokering deals at Babylon will not go near the burned out ruins. They will cry and grieve at the distance because they are terrified of her judgment. Some may stand in their executive suites halfway around the world watching, such as on television, weeping and wailing. Ed Henson was quoted, Here is a great society, not unlike our own, which has forgotten God and all her success. Rather than praising Him for His abundant blessing, they have become obsessed with the pursuit of those blessings. And in the process, they have forgotten the Divine One from whom all those blessings come. Worse, they have forgotten there is no permanent satisfaction in that which is temporal. They are caught in an endless and mindless pursuit of that which can never satisfy their souls. 
Revelation 18, 16. We're going to wrap it up. It says, in saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. We have already learned that the businessmen of the world will cry because Babylon's great power will not protect her. Now we learn that they will cry because her beauty and wealth will also fail to protect her. It matters not how powerful an entity is, how beautiful or how rich. If God decides it should fall, it will surely fall. How Lindsay was quoted, it's not often that you see grown men weeping and wailing, at least not in public. But at this time, there will be no pride left in any man. Everything they have will be lost. The panic will be a hundred times greater than that which followed the U.S. stock market crash of 1929. Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. That's Matthew six nineteen and 20. Good financial planning includes much more than large bank accounts, sound investments, and a diversified portfolio. Everyone needs to think about these things, but the only permanent investments are spiritual. Giving to the Lord's work is truly sound financial planning because it becomes legal tender in heaven. That is the most careful money management of all. We're going to stop here for this week in our study on Prophecies of the Bible. This is a study based on one by Damon Duck. We're going to come back next week, and we'll continue with Revelation chapter 18. And we'll finish that up and possibly get into Revelation 19 as well. In the meantime, you can go visit my website, ConnectingTheGap.net. And there you'll find all the things you need to find out about our ministry with our social media links and much, much more. So please go check that out. Until then, I'll be gone until next week on Thursday. We'll release another new episode of Connecting the Gap. Until then, don't forget that God's Word never fails us. God's Word has stood the test of time. And through Jesus' death on the cross, He has connected the gap. You've been listening to Connecting the Gap podcast. I'm Daniel Moore, the host for this podcast, and I personally thank you for listening each week. In this world, there are many disconnects that cause chaos in our lives. This podcast is birthed from the desire to share hope and restoration of the power of the gospel by being transparent and open in our biblical walk with God. Each week, we take a few moments as we navigate God's Word and peer into other people's testimonies and encourage each other to connect the gap. We upload a new audio podcast every Thursday and a video version of it on YouTube and Rumble. We are also on the Christian podcasting app Edify. You can subscribe to our podcast on many of the available available podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcast, Deezer, Spotify, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, and many more. We are also available on your Alexa-enabled devices. If you would like to give us feedback or would like to contact our ministry for any reason, including prayer, visit our contact page at www.connectingthegap.net and send us a message. We hope you are blessed by this ministry. This is a production of Connecting the Gap Ministries.